Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. To those of you that are online, to those of you that are present, I greet you in the name of the Lord this morning. Today is Palm Sunday. Passover Sunday, Palm Sunday. Today, Jesus Christ, the rabbi from Galilee, is coming to town. The gospel accounts show that Jesus is on a collision course with Jesus is on a collision course with the ruling Jewish authorities and the might of the Roman Empire. Who is this controversial rabbi? Is he a prophet? Is he an insurrectionist? Is he deceived? Is he a deceiver? Or is he the king, the son of David? Today is Palm Sunday. Those of you that are visiting with us today, we welcome you. Thank you for gathering with us on this auspicious occasion. Good morning, everyone. Seems like I'm up here every week. I don't know. <laughs> Just happens that way. I have the pleasure of uh, presenting to you the Mission Minute. And today is about an Easter offering for world evangelism. As followers of Christ, we are all called to be ambassadors of the kingdom throughout the world. And through the Global Church of the Nazarene, you are doing exactly that. Not only are you showing Christ's love to your neighbors locally, but you're also showing it to those thousands of miles away. When your church supports this fund, they are supporting the actions of Nazarenes loving others in Christ's name, truly making Christ-like disciples in all the nations. The Easter offering for world evangelism helps fund the Church of the Nazarene's ministry network as it mobilizes thousands of people to share Christ's transformational love each day. Every dollar helps spread the message of scriptural holiness across the street and across the globe. Louis San Juan or San Jose, grew up as the son of the Nazarene pastor in Guatemala. He knew he had drifted from the Lord. He was a doctor who thought he had everything, including prestige and money, but one day his sense of power was taken from him. What do you say? Thank you and God bless you. Please watch the video. Please watch the video. My world was shattered. Everything that surrounded me, what made me be me, changed within a second. Within a moment, from that point on, nothing was the same. I grew up as a pastor's kid at a Nazarene church. God knew me, but I had drifted away from him I didn't need anyone. I had it all. A great job as a doctor with two specialties, prestige, money. Until one day, my sense of power was taken away. That night, I got an emergency call from the hospital. I left the church service, and right behind me came my 13-year-old son, wanting to go with his dad. As soon as I got in my car, I saw two men with guns go around us. Within seconds, they were inside my car. We were held up with a gun to our heads, taken away, kidnapped. We were afraid. I was afraid. I was beaten badly many times, humiliated, not knowing if we were going to survive or die. It still humbles me to think about it. The guy who didn't need anyone now needing everyone. On the fifth day of captivity, we heard gunshots all over the house. I thought, this is where we die. To our surprise, it was the police. 
that came to rescue us. But we knew life was about to change drastically. And within days, we left our entire lives behind. From warm Guatemala to really cold North Dakota, everything was different. The language, the people, the weather, the culture. We had everything. Now we had nothing. We attended a small Nazarene church in North Dakota. They took care of us. They embraced us like their own family. They didn't ask questions. They just loved us well. I literally met every one of uh, the San Jose's, 19 of you, I think it was. On that Friday night, you guys kind of gathered as a family to heal. And it was just beautiful. Finances, the love, the resources, our time, our energy, none of what we have is ours. And he can use us to distribute it. And San Jose's, we really felt that that was what God was asking us to do. Can you imagine what will happen if all Nazarene churches and beyond will do the same to the immigrants around them, to the broken, to the addicts, to the lost, to the poor? God called me and my wife to be a pastor for the Hispanic community at the same church that opened up their doors to us when we first arrived 15 years ago. My world was shattered, but Jesus healed it through his people. They were his hands and feet. We are his hands and feet. Good morning and blessings to you all here in the sanctuary and on our live stream. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord celebrating Palm Sunday together. I'll ask you to stand in a minute, but first I want to tell you a story. I'm a historian. That, that was my major at university, so you got to put up with the story. Our first hymn that we're going to sing this morning has been long associated with Palm Sunday. It's one of the wonderful classics called All Glory, Laud, and Honor. But I want to tell you a little bit about how this hymn came to us. The hymn's Latin text was originally written by a, a fellow named Saint Theodulf of Orleans in the ninth century, the ninth century. Theodulf was a prominent figure in the court of the conqueror and King Charlemagne. For those of you who have your history lessons and you know how Charlemagne conquered many, many areas in Western Europe. So he was the king of most of Western Europe, but unfortunately for Saint Theodulf, the one who wrote the, the Latin to uh, this hymn, he fell out of favor once Charlemagne was gone with the successor, Louis I, who was also known as Louis the Pious. And worst of all, Theodulf was accused of participating in a rebellion, so he was in, imprisoned in the fr western France city of Angers. I, think, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Angers. And according to legend, here's the interesting point, on a certain Sunday during a procession in the city of Angers, Emperor Louis was present, and as the procession proceeded beneath the tower where Theodulf was imprisoned, the emperor heard a loud and melodious chant from above. To his astonishment, it was the hymn Gloria Laus et Honor, which is the Latin version of All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And it was being sung by none other than his very own prisoner, Theodulf. Moved by compassion, Emperor Louis pardoned Theodulf 
and the saint was allowed to return to his ministry role, and the emperor ordered that the hymn composed by Theodulf be sung on Palm Sunday. Now we go forward a few centuries, and the hymn's English translation was created in the 19th century by John Mason Neal. Um, he was a British fellow, and he was a very skilled translator and me remained very, very faithful to the original text in Latin in his uh, English translation. And then the majestic German tune by Melchior Tezscher, uh, also uh, from several centuries ago, he lived in the uh, 1500s, that further enhances the hymn that we know today. So all glory, laud, and honor is often sung on Palm Sunday in many, many churches, and we're going to be doing that now, commemorating Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and the hymn invites us to join children who praise Jesus with hosannas. So please stand, and together, let us sing this wonderful standard of the church, all glory, laud, and honor.
I would like to invite the kids to come forward so that we can bless them before they go down for Sunday school. I would ask the congregation to extend their hand forward as a gesture of unity in the blessing. Father God, we thank you for each and every child here this morning. We thank you that they are precious in your sight. That even now, you have a plan and purpose for their life. Thank you for their parents and grandparents who have brought them here this morning, knowing that they will receive teaching that will give them a firm foundation in the faith. Thank you, Lord. As we pray for the kids this morning and for the teachers, that your blessing would rest on this time when they are together. Thank you for the diligence and faithfulness of the teachers and the helpers, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that the kids um, you love and that you want to work in their lives. We pray that 
Holy Spirit, you would touch their young hearts and draw them unto yourself. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's lift our hearts to the Lord on this special day of remembrance. Father, we come this morning <clears throat> excuse me, to praise and worship you. Just as your followers did on the first Palm Sunday so long ago, we come with a different perspective because we know that you gave your life on the cross to set us free. How grateful we are, Lord Jesus. You are the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the fairest of the 10,000 to our souls. We worship you this morning, Lord Jesus. You have set us free from the power of sin and death. Because of your sacrifice, we can come boldly to the throne on behalf of others this morning. We think of other churches across our city. And we ask, Father, that by your spirit, you would touch everyone in the congregation. Anoint the pastors, Father. Anoint the music ministry in these churches. For we know that without you, our world will not change. We know that if hearts aren't changed, there's no hope. So we pray for your presence, Lord, in every church across our city this morning, that you would move by your spirit, just as you are moving by your spirit here in our congregation. We thank you for your presence here this morning. We pray for our church, Lord, in this time of transition. We thank you for the unity that we sense among us. Thank you for our interim pastors. Thank you for Steve's lead with the transition team. Thank you for our board, Lord. We pray that just as you have been working in our midst, that your hand will continue to be upon us until we are um, able to draw that person that you have chosen long ago to lead and guide us as a senior pastor. We trust you, Lord, because you have proven yourself faithful and you are worthy of our praise. We pray this morning for our sister church in Oakville, Oakville Generations Hispanic Ministry. We pray for the pastors, Pastor Leonardo and Wendy, Wendy Reyes. They are requesting that we pray for a suitable place to restart Bible studies and services in Milton. And that you, Father, would prepare the hearts of the people who are going to attend these studies. They ask for prayer for young people who regularly attend youth studies in Milton and for wisdom and strength for our youth leaders in Milton. Thank you, Father, that we can come alongside our sister churches across Ontario and bring them before the throne. We know that our prayers are powerful, and we thank you that you move because of them. This morning, we pray for those among us who are unwell those who are in hospital. 
those who are facing surgery, those who are healing from surgeries. We pray, Father, that your hand be upon them, your healing hand, for you indeed are our healer. We pray too, Father, for comfort for those who mourn. Only you, Lord Jesus, can comfort in a way that no one else can. Thank you for your presence with them. Surround them, Lord Jesus, with your love so that they will recognize that you are right there with them. We pray for those who live in countries where it is war-torn. We pray, Father, for those countries where there is famine, horrific events because of the weather. We pray, Father, that your will will come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for peace, Lord. In your word, Lord, you have told us to, play, to pray, first of all, for those in authority so that we can live peacefully. So, Father, we bring our world governments before you this morning. We pray, Lord, that there would be a turnaround. Change hearts, Father, because that is the root of it all. Bring them unto yourself, we pray. We pray for our own government here in Canada. And we pray, Father, for those who um, stand up for righteousness. We pray that you would continue to strengthen them supernaturally, Lord, so that they can take that stand. And I pray, Father, for each one of us that we too would stand up for righteousness. Thank you, Father, that we can worship freely. Many cannot, and we are blessed because we are free. Thank you, Father. We cannot really understand what it would mean not to be able to worship. Thank you, Father, for our music ministry. Thank you for the times that they come and practice. Thank you for Pastor Maurizio's uh, leading in this vital ministry. Jesus said that if his people can't praise him. The rocks would cry out. <laughs> Imagine. Father, I pray that this morning your anointing would be on Pastor Jeff as he brings the Palm Sunday message. We thank you as we look expectantly ahead to what you have for us this morning. And we pray, Father, that it will change us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. <clears throat> In a few minutes' time, Pastor Rob will bring us the scripture this morning. And our prayer is always that the scripture will sink deeply into our hearts and give us new wisdom and insight on what the Lord has for us. In preparation for the hearing of God's word, we want to sing one of the great modern worship songs. We'll praise the name. And as, as you stand and as you sing this, I want you to sing it as a prayer, but I also want you to imagine that you are on that road in Jerusalem when Jesus arrives. You're on one side or the other of the road in Jerusalem. While people are shouting hosannas, while children are waving palm branches and putting palm branches on the road in front of Christ as he comes on the back of a donkey as the king proceeding through Jerusalem. As you sing this song, imagine that you're in that crowd. 
singing praises to Jesus. Let's stand together and let's sing together. Oh, praise the name.
actually I'll get you all to stand again. So I'm reading from Luke chapter 19, verse 28 to 48. The triumphal entry. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Pet Bethany on the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. You untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the, on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully praise God loud, in a loud voice for all miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known this day that would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and your children with, within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple again, uh, the temple area, and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they, could find, they couldn't find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his word. Thank you for his word. Good morning, everyone, again. Today is Palm Sunday. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Let us pray. Lord, this is Palm Sunday, the day in which your son rode into Jerusalem. Lord, let us not miss the day of visitation. Let us not miss what you are wanting to say and do through your word this morning. We yield ourselves to you, King Jesus. May you be glorified. May your will, your kingdom reign be done here in this place as it is in heaven. For we pray it in your name, in your most kingly and holy name, to the glory of your Father. Amen. Today is Palm Sunday. Jesus is coming to town riding on a donkey. The disciples are shouting and praising. The religious leaders are fuming. The incredulous onlookers are wondering. And between the clothing on the ground, the crowds, the shouts, the palm leaves waving, can you see it? The palm leaves waving. The lamb of God on a donkey and the hundreds of lambs being herded by shepherds of Bethlehem 
into Jerusalem that day for annual Passover, it must have been quite a sight. I call it holy chaos. Dust, people, animals everywhere proceeding into Jerusalem. Today is Palm Sunday. First slide, please. And here comes Jesus riding on a young donkey. What is going on in this picture? Well, a little context. The city of Jerusalem at that time consisted of, and this may shock some of you, approximately 25,000 people. Is that a city? Well, in modern day here, that would be considered a town. But back then, it was a city. But during the high Jewish festival of Passover, this population that Jesus entered into in Jerusalem that day would have swollen to approximately 125,000 people heralding the Jewish festival of Passover. Jewish pilgrims from all over the Roman Empire would converge on Jerusalem to celebrate their deliverance from death and slavery out of Egypt. This was a high point in the Jewish festival. And part of that convergence that day was the coming of this controversial rabbi from Galilee, coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. So what was going on that day? Well, it's complicated. How many of you this morning, if I was to talk to you and talk about your life, you would say, you know, Jeff, my life is complicated. Would that be you? Oh, it's so complicated. How did life get so complicated? Well, I have good news for you this morning. Jesus is complicated. In fact, he's infinitely more complicated than you, and that gives me great hope. That gives me great encouragement. Because life is complicated. And the Lord of life is complicated. And on that day, it was complicated. There was a lot going on. Well, it's complicated. So this morning, there was no one single answer as to why Jesus was riding into Jerusalem that day. I want you to back up in your minds from crucifixion, from what happens next week to this week. This complicated scene with so many textures and nuances. This morning, let's look for answers from the donkey's perspective from the donkey's perspective, all right? What was Jesus doing riding on a donkey? Well, the donkey heralds the kingship of Jesus Christ. But Jesus wasn't doing anything particularly novel here. Now, I'm not taking anything away from what Jesus was doing, but kings riding on a donkey had precedent in Israel's past. In 1 Kings 1.33, King Solomon rides on a donkey to his coronation as king of all of Israel. In Judges 5.10, it says the judges of Israel, these were rulers of Israel before the Jewish monarchy, the judges of Israel would ride on donkeys. It was a thing. In 2 Samuel 16.2, members of the Jewish royal household would ride donkeys. And in Patriarch Jacob's blessing over his son Judah, thank you, Pastor Mariella. When Jacob is in Egypt and he's dying and he's blessing his sons, he prays over Judah, which was Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather. While this patriarch is praying over Jesus, he prophesies over Judah, mentioning a donkey. In Genesis 49, 11, isn't God amazing? And in Zechariah 9, 9, we have the famous prophecy that announces to Jerusalem that behold, your king is coming to you, your humble king is coming to you, riding on a donkey. So there are pretty important kingly people and rulers in the life of Israel who rode on donkeys. 
And if you listen to the disciples shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, it's clearly evident that both Jesus, by asking for a donkey, and his disciples, they were announcing and declaring Jesus as Israel's rightful king as he rode on that donkey into town. Israel's rightful king. But you see, unlike the punitive power of Rome, of Caesar, this King Jesus was coming on different terms of surrender, offering peace, shalom, and atonement through his broken body. So that's the first thing from the perspective of of a donkey. The second perspective, Jesus riding on a donkey is a foreshadowing of a father sacrificing his only son. Genesis 22.3 records the presence of a donkey used as Abraham goes off to sacrifice his only son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Do some of you know that story? Imagine what it must have been going to Abraham's mind when God told him, I want you to sacrifice your only son, the son that you love. And where did that donkey take Isaac and Abraham? It took them to Mount Moriah, which was to become Jerusalem. Interesting, isn't it? And truly the Lamb of God that day riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, surrounded by lambs being herded for Passover sacrifice, would speak of Jesus' pending sacrifice on the cross for the sins of all humanity. The second perspective. And there's a third perspective. Jesus riding on a donkey speaks of coming judgment. In Numbers 22, God used a donkey speaking to the prophet Balaam. God can do anything, saints. He can speak to us through animals. And in Numbers 22, God used a donkey speaking to the prophet Balaam to both reveal judgment and to prevent judgment. It was the donkey that saved Balaam from being killed by the angel of the Lord. And in like manner, Jesus uses a donkey to enter Jerusalem to announce God's judgment on Jerusalem and then make a way through his cross to avert God's judgment. So when you ask what's going on with Jesus riding into Jerusalem, there's no one simple answer. And here's the application, my brothers and sisters. For if Jesus' life and purpose had so many nuances and so many layers of meaning, if there's so many things going on in this picture, beware of easy answers about Jesus. Beware of putting Jesus in a box and reducing his life and death into a neat little formula. Beware of that, saints. Beware of relating and thinking about Jesus in your daily walk with him in a one-dimensional, flat manner. Beware of defining and understanding your Christian faith in overly simplistic terms, in what I call reductionist terms. Beware of that. Give entrance to King Jesus this morning in your life, in all your complicated and messy life, in all the messy areas of your life. Give entrance to King Jesus this morning. Allow Jesus to fill these complexities, these messes, and these layers of your life. Because King Jesus is multi-dimensional in all of our lives. He is more than all that we can imagine or think. And he is the one who has intersected our lives. We can give it to him all. All of us. All of us. All of it. The good, the bad, the ugly. All of it. Jesus is no stranger to complexity. Next slide, please. Today is Palm Sunday. Jesus comes riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. Ah, there it is. A picture of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Very significant place, don't you know? Jerusalem was the center of the world for Jews. 
Jerusalem was the joy of the whole earth for Jews. Jerusalem, the city that Yahweh, the Lord God, had promised to inhabit forever. And when Jesus sees Jerusalem that day, he weeps. And why does Jesus weep? It's complicated. This morning I'm going to suggest a couple of reasons. In Ezekiel 10, the prophet Ezekiel has a vision of Yahweh leaving the temple. He has a vision, in fact, of Yahweh leaving Jerusalem because of the sins of the people of Israel. And every Jew from the time of the temple's destruction by the Babylonian Empire in 586, hundreds of years later, to the time of Jesus, every Jew longed for the return of Yahweh back to Jerusalem, back to the temple. Every Jew longed for that. And in Isaiah 40, verses 9 and 10, we capture this Jewish hope of the good news of Yahweh the King coming back to Jerusalem. Behold your King, O Zion. And in Isaiah 62, 11, speaks of the promise of Yahweh to the daughters of Jerusalem that he is coming back with reward and recompense. So in verse 44, Jesus weeps because Jerusalem refused to recognize that in Jesus, Yahweh was indeed coming back to Jerusalem. Or as Jesus himself puts it, Jerusalem has failed to recognize the time of their visitation by Yahweh in the person of Jesus. That's why John 1.11 can say, Jesus came to his own, his own people, his own Israel, and his own did not receive him. Jesus wept, it says. And a second reason Jesus weeps is because by failing to recognize and submit to Jesus, to King Jesus, by failing to recognize him as God's chosen Messiah, by failing to recognize his message of love and accept his message of love, forgiveness, and reconciliation, The nation of Israel is on a collision course with the power of Rome. And Jesus is saying, in fact, that by failing to acknowledge him as son of God and son of man and choosing the route of nonviolence, of loving your enemies, of going the second mile, by rejecting that message and by rejecting his teaching, Jesus said, God's judgment will fall upon Jerusalem and she will be destroyed by Rome itself. So this morning I want to ask each and every one of you, what makes you weep? What makes you weep? What are the things that bring you to tears? Do you ever think about that? Maybe for some of you, you haven't cried in years. Maybe some of you, you have cried today. And I want to ask this question, have any of us ever cried over London, Ontario? Have you ever cried over this city? What's going on in this city? You see, my brothers and sisters, for those that are followers of Christ, there is a spiritual reality that within the heart of God, within the heart of the triune God, of Father, Son, and Spirit, he weeps for his lost creation. Jesus weeps for those who will not come to him, for those who refuse to submit to him, to his terms of surrender, death on a cross. And Jesus weeps because he knows that God's judgment is coming. When every person that has ever lived, any person that has ever lived, will be judged by Almighty God for the things that they have done in their bodies, whether good or evil. So this morning I want to ask us, do we weep for London that way? Do we weep for the lost and those who are perishing, our neighbors, all those around us? 
the late Pastor John Stott makes this sad confession that the pattern of the Western Church over the last 200 years, that's us, has been that of a largely tearless Christianity. One of my favorite quotes, and I confess I have not lived in it as I should have, Reg Pierce, who himself had a tragic life, but who founded World Vision starting in Korea, once prayed, Lord, break my heart for the things that break your heart. Oh, my brothers and sisters, as I ask that question, when was the last time you wept as Jesus wept? I confess to you that for far too long a time in my own life, my own eyes have been dry for the lost and the dying. Now as he drew near, Jesus saw the city of Jerusalem and he wept over it. Next slide, please. Today is Palm Sunday. Jesus comes into the Jewish temple and he drives out the money changers. He declares that the original intention of the temple was that it was to be a place of prayer. Another gospel writer says, a place for all nations to come and pray. And then he begins to teach the people. The Jewish temple some of you have heard me say this before. In Jewish understanding, the temple, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, in Jewish thinking, was the divine intersection point between heaven and earth. It was the center locus point of the universe. It was the divine intersection point between God and his people. Indeed, God and humanity. And how wonderfully godly and ironic and over the top, that on Palm Sunday, the living human and divine embodiment of that reality, the God-man, Jesus Christ, entered this physical building. So what's going on here in this passage? Overturning, overturning tables? Driving out money changers? Well, it's complicated but I'd like to share two answers that give a partial yet incomplete answer for this morning. There's so many things going on here, but I will share two of those things that are going on that I believe to be true from God's word. First, we Christians believe that Jesus is here fulfilling the prophecy in Malachi 3, verse 1, where it says, Yahweh, Yahweh, whom the Jewish people long for, will suddenly come to his temple. They waited 400 years. And on Palm Sunday, listen for it please, Jesus, whom Paul says in Colossians 2.9, is the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form, suddenly comes to his temple in this passage of Luke. He comes to his temple. But secondly, what is going on here has to do with turning over the tables of those money changers. Those who had set up booths in the temple to act as currency traders. If you were a Jew from Phrygia, you couldn't pay to have a sacrifice done in the temple with Phrygian currency. So you had to get it exchanged for Jewish temple currency. And the money changers were the currency converters of their day. Hmm. So why would Jesus have such a problem, such umbrage that he overturned the tables of this seemingly legitimate practice? Well, besides pocketing some extra profit on the side, if you know what I mean, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more, say no more, These money changers represent, I believe, transactional religion at its worst. Transactional religion at its worst. You see, Jesus did not come to his temple to bring transactional religion. 
He came to bring relational religion. And if you have a problem this morning with that word religion, please don't. Because in biblical times, having religion was not a bad thing. It did not mean the legalism and the rigidity that it means today. It meant authentic spirituality or inauthentic spirituality. So today is Palm Sunday. Jesus has come to his temple. And I would like this morning to compare, and I'd like you to think of these comparisons. May these words go deep into your spirits of the comparison of the difference between the transactional religion of the money changers compared to the relational religion of Jesus Christ. You see, it is the comparison and difference between this. Religious performance versus religious intimacy. Religious ritual and liturgy. There's a place for that. Versus knowing and experiencing the heart of God. It's going from what can God do for me versus God can have all of me. It's the difference between religious activity versus heart religious prayer. It's the difference between self-fulfilling, self-fulfillment, and self-emptying. It's the difference between sacrifice versus obedience. It's the difference between being building-focused versus Jesus-focused. It's the difference between temple-building versus Jesus as the temple. It's the difference between knowing about God versus Abba, intimacy with God. It's the difference between self-satisfaction versus spiritual hunger. And it's the difference as God is a means to my end versus I am simply a means to his end upon the earth. And it's the difference between a mentality that says, I will spend on whatever I want to, I will be spent for God alone. Today is Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday. And this morning, do we really see the difference between the heart of Jesus compared to the heart of these money changers, of the currency converters? There is a world of difference. To conclude, today is Palm Sunday. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and everything changed. He knew where he was going. He knew where he had come from. He knew the price that it would take and the price that would be paid upon his body. So if everything changed, if everything has changed with Palm Sunday, the question I want to leave with you is, what has changed in your life since Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day? Are you a praising disciple? Are you a religious critic? Are you a confused onlooker? Or are you, like the donkey, a servant for his purposes servant for his glory. What has changed in your life? Today is Palm Sunday. Life will never be the same again. going to do something a little different this morning. We're going to sing our way out a little chorus, a very simple chorus, and we think that uh, you'll catch on to it very quickly. Just before I do that, I just want to do a little shout out. 
a few weeks ago, our leadership asked uh, our dear brother, Rob Russell, if he would make us a new cross for our platform. And uh, we didn't know what we were in for. He came up with this wonderful piece. The, the wood is fantastic. Nobody knew it was going to be backlit or this beautiful, this beautiful uh, piece of fabric draped over. Thank you, Rob, for, for beautifying our congregation. <laughs> Rob is a true servant of the Lord, and uh, it was such a pleasure to have him read the scripture this morning, and uh, we just delight in his work, his ability, and his, uh, his passion for the Lord. So, we'd like you to stand, and we're going to um, sing a little, yeah, it's a little chorus from the 1980s, very short, one verse, called Hallelujah, Praise the Lamb. And you know, since we can't be in Jerusalem, we can still pretend that we are, we are waving palm tree, palm trees, palm, palm branches. And if you want, you can hold your hands up, you can wave your hands as if you're, as if you're uh, yeah, as if you're there at the time of Jerusalem and, and waving palm branches. But this is a wonderful little praise the Lord kind of song. So, yeah, we'll sing it a few times over, and then we'll have our benediction. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings this song again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. My heart sings this song again. Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. Hallelujah. remain standing for the benediction. Today is Palm Sunday. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a young donkey. He wept because then, as is now, so many misunderstood and missed his visitation. As we go into Holy Week, as we go into celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord, I believe, would say, if there is anyone here that does not know Lord, has not received his blood atonement, has not surrendered the knee and become a child of God, a son or daughter of the Most High, this is your invitation. This is your invitation. Do not miss the day of his visitation. We're going to have announcements in a few minutes that's going to kind of jig-jog or zigzag with this invitation. But if anyone here has heard the call of the Lord this morning that the Lord is passing by, 
I'm going to ask that you would see myself or Pastor Mariella or somebody that you trust that's close to you to pray for you. And we will welcome King Jesus together. Christ behind you, Christ in front of you, Christ on your left, Christ on your right, Christ below you, Christ above you, Christ in all things, Son of Man and Son of God. Amen. You may be seated.